Hey guys, and thanks so much for tuning in to this week's Original Strength Podcast. We're going to do another Q&A today. Apparently the first one sparked more questions, so I thought we would uh, entertain those questions and just see what happens, all right? So the first question comes from our listener who says, I love training hard because I like the look it gives me, muscular. But I know deep down inside that I don't feel great every day and I have some aches and pains and some buildup of fatigue. I would appreciate your thoughts on ways that I can feel both good and still chase PRs and train close to failure and push myself to gain muscle and strength. Uh, that could be a, a deep question. So, and this is going to vary for every individual, but I think, I think the first place is, is it's okay to chase PRs and it's okay to want to look muscular. And I mean, it's great. Uh, and it's, I mean, and you want to be able to challenge yourself and know what you can do sometimes. I, I, I guess my first piece of advice though would be to just make sure you're doing it for you. Uh, because at the end of the day, even though a big bicep might turn somebody's head, that's it. That's about all it'll do. Uh, so, so as long as you're training for yourself and it is purely out of your own joy and your own motivation, then have at it. And I think if you have that pure motivation where it's just purely all for you, that you can find that balance in the level of effort you put forth also feels good. Now, having said that, there are things you wanna have in place. Like you wanna have a good foundation of movement. That's where a lot of the movements in original strength or the pressing reset, that's really where they shine because they give you that foundation. They help, they help your nervous system feel safe so that it takes the brakes off. And a lot of times the aches and pains we have is the body trying to get your attention. And a lot of times it's trying to get your attention because the right things just aren't in place and and it, it doesn't feel good. So I guess from a movement standpoint, just make sure that you have a solid foundation, you're breathing properly with your diaphragm, you have really good head control, you're good at rolling. If you roll really well, chances are you're gonna move well enough that you can do almost anything in the gym or outside the gym beautifully. And, and, and your, your aches and pains will be less. Rocking also, if you, if you spend any time rocking, it greatly helps uh, the joints. It helps the nervous system figure out where all the major moving parts are and how they're supposed to dance together. And a lot of times when the nervous system has all that information, the body just feels better. So make sure you have a good solid movement foundation that you can easily press reset throughout those movements. And then again, then you have to find the balance in, well, if your aches, if you have aches and pains and you are moving well, are you eating well? Is your nutrition good? Are you sleeping good? So there's all these other variables that come into play. But I think if you're truly pushing yourself, trying to get PRs and you're trying to stay muscular, as long as you're doing that from a pure motivation standpoint, I, I think you can find that happy medium. I like, and I don't know what that is for you. I would also tell you though that PRs, there's a lid to them. And sometimes it's, you have to be creative in how you want to chase your PRs. Instead of going this way, maybe you want to go that way. So just keep that in mind. It's not really a clear cut answer, but I think you'll come to a point where you'll get this balance of, you know what? I'm happy with the way I look and I'm really happy with the like, way I feel. Because if you, if you chase how you look over how you feel, and you neglect how you feel, typically you, you'll, you'll turn around. You'll come back around and say, you know what, I'd just rather feel good. Because um, some of that glory is, is it's fading, but feeling good is priceless. Anyway, that's a really good question. Thanks for writing that in. I have another question. This one's way simpler. Um, you talk a lot about putting your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Where is that exactly? That's a good question. So. For most people, if you just swallow, close your lips, swallow, your tongue will go to the roof of your mouth and it will go where it naturally just wants to go and that's where it naturally belongs. So if you don't know where to put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, just swallow. Now, while it's there, you didn't ask this, but I'll go ahead and tell you, that's where it wants to rest. So think of the word rest. So. The tongue should just be resting on against the roof of the mouth. So if you're trying to act actively press with a lot of uh, pressure or be forceful with it, a little much, don't have to do that. That takes energy. So it's just a nice relaxed hold 
or rest on the roof of the mouth. So I don't know if you know, but the tongue is the rudder that guides the whole ship. The reason you want it on the roof of your mouth is because it makes everything about you work better. It completes all the information. The point is though, if you keep your tongue where it belongs, everything about you works better. You will breathe easier. Uh, your balance will be better. You will move better. You can express more power. You can, if, if you're into martial arts, you can strike harder. If, uh, what if you'd like to lift weights, you can push more weight. So if you are chasing PRs and things like that, moving better, your tongue just belongs there. I can give you some really cool information about what happens when you don't keep your tongue where it belongs. Uh, most people that let their tongue rest on the bottom of their mouth tend to have forward head carriage, which means their head walks into the their room before their body does. And the reason you don't want to have that is because, well, then your posture is kind of jacked and everything has to change to compensate that. And here your head weighs very little when your head is up over your shoulders where it belongs, but when it's out in front of you, your body, it is kind of like your head all of a sudden weighs 40 pounds on your cervical spine. That's not good. But just from a movement efficiency, um, postural, just beautiful movement standpoint and ease and quality of life, tongue and roof of your mouth change your life. So if you haven't learned, if you haven't picked that up from me yet, that you get that one thing, keep your tongue and roof of your mouth, change your life. And if I said that in the other Q&A, then that just means it is that important to listen to it again, especially if you're not doing it. All right, next question. This question comes from Varun. Um, how, I noticed that you were sitting down on the floor during your Q&A. How long do you sit on the floor? Do you practice floor sitting? And do you ever sit in a chair? What are your thoughts about floor sitting and the importance of it? So yes, Varun, I, uh, I, I'm sitting on the floor now. I do sit on the floor quite often, I think. So to, to your first question, sitting on the floor is very important to do because I, I, I honestly think it can keep you healthy. So when we're a child, we grow our strength on the floor. Most adults spend very, especially in the, in the West, spend very little time on the floor. But also in the West, the number one place most adults are afraid to be, especially if they're over 50, is on the floor because they're afraid of falling. Because if they fall, they get hurt and they can't get back up. But here's the thing. If you are very well acclimated to being on the floor and you're used to being on the floor, you're not going to be afraid of being on the floor. And if you are constantly getting up and down off the floor, then you're constantly getting up and down off the floor, which means that you have the strength and the mobility to be able to do so. So you, have, if you show up every day and you challenge your body by spending time on the floor, well, that just feels like home. And your body can easily maneuver itself around getting up and down. Your joints are gonna move well. You're gonna have the strength to resist gravity, which also means you'll have the strength to avoid falling. So if you trip, you're just gonna, you're gonna more likely be able to recover from that trip. And even if you do fall on the ground, you're going to be strong enough to get up off the ground. So I think floor sitting is invaluable and you don't have to just sit. It can be just spending time on the floor uh, for pressing reset and original strength. We, you know, we have people rock on the floor and roll on the floor all the time. And, and it is about the nervous system, about showing up and getting those movements embedded in the nervous system. But it's also about having the strength to be able to do those things. So good question. I think everybody should spend time on the floor. You asked another question. Do I ever sit in a chair? Yes, I do. Now, listen, uh, especially here in, in, I say the West, I live in North Carolina, which is the East coast of the United States, but chairs are a way of life. Uh, I don't think we can avoid chairs. If we ride in a car, or ride in an airplane, chairs aren't going to kill us. We're just not made to spend all our time in chairs. So when I use a chair, I sit on the edge of the chair. So I never sit back and lean back in the chair. I use them like stools, but then I'm also using my body's postural muscles and my skeleton. I'm using my design to sit in a chair. Basically, I'm not molding and fitting into the, the shape of the chair. All right. So Varun has, Varun actually has quite a bit of questions. So, so Varun, uh, let's see. Varun has a question about neuroplasticity. He would also like to know my take on neuroplasticity and learning new movements or things 
over the course of a lifetime. He has attended Ido Portal, who is a fantastic mover. He has attended one of his workshops. He's a movement specialist. If you've never heard of Ido Portal, just YouTube him. That guy is quite amazing. And Ido stresses learning new movements and challenging yourself throughout your life. But this is counterintuitive to when you say, when you talk about doing your 21s and showing up every day and doing the 21s. By the way, I'm a big fan of the 21s and I feel wonderful after doing them, but there's a doubt in my head about doing them the same every day, basically based off of what Ido, Ido is saying about challenging yourself. So this is about neuroplasticity. Yes. So first off, I agree. Ido is right. Uh, you should challenge yourself and, and learn new skills that keeps you young and healthy throughout your life. And that is part of the neuro neuroplasticity. So if you don't know, neuroplasticity means that your brain is plastic, not that it's made out of uh, petrochemicals, but that it is capable of change and throughout your life. So when you're born, your brain's like a, it's just a, it's, it's growing and it's always, it's laying all these neural connections and everything you learn, you lay a new neural connection now. That never stops throughout your life. And so you probably heard that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, that was just a, a dumb saying about dogs because most people thought that the brain you have is the brain you have. And if something happens to it, then you're, you're, you're done. You're out of luck. Well, that's just not true. And even if it were true, you're not a dog, right? So you're a person. But the human brain and the dog brain is plastic. You are capable of learning and developing neural networks throughout your entire life. And what that means is, and, it, and that is broad, like it's not just about new skills, it's about new thoughts. Every time you have a new thought, you create a new neural connection. Like a thought becomes a real living thing. It goes from nothing to something just because you thought it and you created a neural pathway in your brain about it. Anyway, Ido is correct. You should challenge yourself and, and, and learn new skills and do things uh, to stimulate your nervous system. That's true. But also true, your nervous system needs constant stimulation to keep the things that you want to keep as well. So what I mean is, is the nervous system works off of use it or lose it because it is plastic. If there is not a demand placed on the nervous system, then it will start to prune away the things it no longer needs because it's not efficient. The nervous system wants efficiency. It wants to be, it doesn't want to waste energy. So if you don't show up every day and do like, you don't have to do the 21s, but if, if any skill you want to have or any movement that you're designed and you should have, you need to engage in it. Because if you don't engage in that movement, you're not using the neural pathways for that movement and they will start to disappear. So from, from my standpoint, if I show up every day and do the 21s or I press reset every day, I'm never going to lose that ever. I can still show up and learn new skills. And those skills will be just as great as I want to invest in and spend the time to learn and lay those neural connections down and do them again and again and again and again and again and again. But the day I stop deciding that I want to no longer want to, to invest in that and I no longer engage in those movements, I am going to engage in losing the neural efficiency that I had for those movements. And now you won't lose it all like that. I mean, it depends on how much you put into it. But over time, your skills can fade. And that's just the way it is. So Ido's right if you, you should challenge yourself. But there comes, again, and this is, gets back to our, our original question about chasing PRs and things. There's going to be, you have to, there's going to be a lid. So how, how am I going to challenge myself every day physically? I can. I can go for hikes, I can go do something new, I can learn all these new things, and it's just good novel stimulation. To me, those are worthy challenges and they keep the brain alive and active, but it, but I'm not trying to re retain a bunch of skills that I don't need either. So I think as far as the spirit of what Ido is saying is, is get out and move your body um, and do some fun things, like expose yourself to to life so that you have the neural uh, nets and the neural wiring to be able to, to conquer other things in life. So uh, yeah, I, so here's the point. If you spend a lifetime in a chair or never going outside of your house and never doing anything but video games, you're challenging your body very little. It doesn't need a lot of neural connections to do that. 
So to Ito's point, get outside, move your body, learn how to crawl, climb, and do all this these fantastic things, and you're going to have all the neural connections that you need to have to enjoy your life. Part of that is is being active every day is showing up. So going outside and playing or doing all the things that Ito does, that's just showing up. That's just the same thing as doing 21s. You show up every day, you lay those neural connections down, and you establish a wonderful neural network. You've got your nervous system feels safe. It's got all this great information that it's used to getting exposed to. It knows how to move. It knows where everything in your body is. It's going to let you move, and you're going to feel great. But if you don't show up every day and you spend most of your time inside and once every weekend or every two or three weeks you decide to go do something, you may not have all the, the foundation you need to, to move well. So you don't, you haven't challenged yourself. Your body's not ready to move. Your nervous system doesn't feel safe. You ache, you pain. You can't learn new skills quickly because you have no foundation for movement whatsoever. And then, well, you, you, that's just the way neuroplasticity works. I hope that answers your question, Varun. It's a good question. Um, but Ido is 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 right. You do need to challenge yourself, but I think I think the spirit of it is is move your body, and that's the challenge. All right. Are there any more questions from Varun? There are not. All right, guys. That was a quick Q and A. Oh, wait, wait. So, as fortune would have it, as soon as I stopped recording the Q&A, someone wrote in with a bunch of Qs for the A's. So, we have more. All right, so this question is from Rip. What are the names of every reset? Well, Rip, there are five main resets that we teach in Original Strength, and they're breathing with the diaphragm properly, uh, head control, which is activating your vestibular system, rolling on the floor, rocking back and forth on your hands and knees and crawling and or the gait pattern. So crawling is walking, is marching, is skipping. Those are the five resets. <clears throat> Next question from Rip is, do any and all of the resets have progressions or regressions? Yes, they do. And we actually teach uh, those regressions and or progressions at our original strength workshops. So one reset can be broken down or added to in several, several different ways. Again, like so crawling is a reset, but a progression of crawling uh, neurologically would be walking. It's not muscularly a progression because it's way easier to walk than it is to crawl. So that would be a muscular progression, but walking is a neurological progression over crawling, even though crawling is a muscular progression over walking. I hope that makes sense. It takes more energy to crawl than it does to walk, but it's neurologically uh, more challenging to walk than it is to crawl. Uh, so, but again, we, we go over all of that at our workshops. Um, can I find every reset mentioned in one place? Yes, you can. Uh, we have a book called Original Strength, um, Pressing Reset Reloaded. <clears throat> um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm stupid, guys. We have a book called Pressing Reset, Original Strength Reloaded. Uh, that is available on Amazon.com and other fine bookstores. We also have uh, a DVD uh, called Pressing Reset also available on amazon.com and let's see uh, rip has another question they're starting to get personal this is fun um, what herbs and supplements and brands do you take so to be honest currently i only take a, a probiotic from the garden of life uh, because you know life is we're made to move and so might as well keep moving get it um so so but now to be honest uh like i i throughout my life and history have gone through seasons of of taking supplements and or and doing all kinds of i've, I've gone through seasons of everything uh currently i'm in the season of i'm not taking really a bunch of uh anything supplement wise um i do take the probiotics if i mm -hmm. am having a hard time getting food in i will do uh protein supplements i'm not really picky as long as it has to taste good it has to taste good i like uh garden of life i find makes decent protein um either in vegan and or, or whey uh, they're pretty good um but like i said everything seasons that's where i'm at right now there was a time when uh my grocery bill was vastly overshadowed by my supplement bill and i was actually just trying to live off supplements matter of fact when i wrote the becoming bulletproof book when i first wrote it back in 2010 i was in my kitchen one day and i had probably i bet i had at least easily 12 uh pills in my hand you know uh, multivitamins and uh, omega fatty acids 
and I was reaching them. I was gonna, I was gonna pop them in my mouth. And as my hand was coming up to my mouth, I just heard in my head, and it was so random, it kind of spooked me out, that I heard, "You will not find your salvation in a bottle." And <laughs> my hand was right in front of my face, and then I, I kind of paused because that was just odd. It was weird. It was the wildest thought. Like it didn't really seem like a thought though, Brent, but it was in my head. Granted, um, but it made me put the vitamins down and I walked away. Now I wrote about this uh, actually, but who knows who reads anything, um, especially I wrote about it a long time ago, but I didn't really know the depth of that at the time. I just know that it made me feel weird and uneasy, uh, but it's powerful. Like you can't find your salvation in a bottle, no matter what the bottle is, no matter if it's a alcohol, a bottle of pills, a prescription pills, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not even if vitamins. I think the I think the the gist of that message though is is salvation's in us. It's not outside of us. Anyway, that's my really weird vitamin story. But and now now I'm told you I'm in the season right now where I don't really take a lot of anything. That's not to say it won't change one day. I may decide one day I want to try something and you know do something else. I am now open to hey change happens and I'm I change and everybody changes. All right, so sorry, Rip. Next question. Uh, you said that you wake at 5 a.m. and eat your first meal at 10 a.m. Are you intermittent fasting and how many hours is your feeding window? So again, I do just seasons of things. Currently, currently in this season, uh, my first meal is around 10 and my second meal is around 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, so 10 a.m. to 6 and 7 p.m. Now, at 6 or 7 p.m. when I start eating, I may not stop eating until like an hour and a half later. Uh, not, not continuous, but I, 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 eat a, I try to eat a big dinner and feel good, like full, like satisfied. And then I'll give myself like a 30 minute rest or maybe a 45 minute rest and then I'll have a nice snack, something that tastes good. Uh, sometimes it's pancakes, sometimes it's oatmeal, sometimes it's a bowl of cereal. Um, but I, I like to end my day with something that I'm generally pretty satisfied with. Um, and then I go to bed and then I wake up and do my thing in the morning again and next day at 10 a.m. and I eat again. That's currently where I'm at. I guess you could call it intermittent fasting. I just, it's just something I wanted to try. I have done intermittent fasting where I started my first meal at two and f f f it was a 16 and eight window and you know, so, or whatever it is. Oh, yeah, 16 and eight. So after two, I would like binge or eat the rest of the day. Uh, I, which is not like, you know, the true spirit of intermittent fasting, but that's just what I did. All right. Next question. Rip has a lot of questions. Thank you, Rip. I really do appreciate the questions. Rip's question is, a chiropractor told me that they get adjusted once every week by another chiropractor. Do you believe in this? And do you believe in chiropractic at all? If so, when is the last time you went? I do believe in chiropractors. Um, I know some of them personally. Uh, one of our one of our master instructors is a chiropractor, and he's extremely talented, Dr. Mike Musselman. Actually, did a podcast with him uh, a few weeks back. So, do I believe in chiropractic adjustment? I absolutely do. I think there's so many modalities that we can approach health and fitness uh, that you know used to approach health and fitness with, and sometimes we need help. Sometimes uh, we may get injured or we may have an impact happen to our bodies or just something happens and we may need the expertise or help of somebody else to help us get back our, our ability to move. Now, while I believe in the value of chiropractic uh, medicine and other medicines, I also believe in the value of we need to do our part and move. So if you just go to a chiropractor and you have a chiropractor do work on you, that's kind of passive. I believe in the best approach is the active and passive approach where if I go to a chiropractor and he does something to me, now I want that to stick. I need to do something active to help what he did make a real impact. Otherwise, if I just allow him to adjust me and I get back in my car and go back to my desk and I only sit and do nothing else, what he did will feel good for a second, but I will go right back to my ways of being that brought me to his office to start with. So. If we're going to do those alternative uh, care approaches, we still need to do our part. Everything we can do to make sure our body's working the way it is designed to work, which means we need to move as we're designed to give his adjustment time to take, make effect. I hope that makes sense. Um, it's a really good question. When is the last time you went? Honestly, I go whenever I feel like I can't move myself out of a situation. <laughs> 
uh, or if I just want to feel good. Sometimes uh, having someone else place their hands on you and, uh, and, and adjust you, that tactile feel, especially if it's a trusted person, it just feels good. And you know if they care about your well-being and you know their intention is to help you feel better, just them touching you, I think there's value in that. There's a there's just good energy in that. And it's just good to be around like-minded people that you can have that trust relationship with. Now, I'm in a different situation. I know a lot of chiropractors. I'm friends with a lot of chiropractors, and especially a few in particular that I just like being around them. So I regularly seek time to go be around them because I, I want to pick their brain. I want to learn. I want to feel good. And I, I just want to create keep that relationship going. So if you don't have a really good chiropractor that you're a friend with, I suggest both having a chiropractor and a good friend and then kind of like making those two one and the same. Uh, all right, so last question. In the last Q&A, you mentioned a sculpted guy named Maxic. I can't find him. Uh, please spell out his full name and maybe a link where I can find his books. I'll tell you what, I will do that. His uh, name is Maxix, and I will put that information in the bottom of this podcast. Rip, thank you so much for the questions. I really do appreciate it. And now, for real, guys, this time, there are no more questions. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to the Original Strength Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Original Strength Podcast.